Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with musician and owner of Parker Jazz Club in Austin, Texas, Chris Kimura. He opened up about Austin's premier live jazz music venue as they've reopened their doors and announced a host of great shows in the coming 2021 months. The club is named after the young son of this award-winning jazz vocalist, multi-instrumentalist, founder and opener of the club. It opened back in 2018, and from the jump, they offer the city a state-of-the-art listening room where legends like the Count Basie Orchestra, Harry Connick, Kenny Garrett, and so many others have performed. He's passionate about his dreams that have come true, and he opens up very candidly and fully about it. Enjoy. How are you? Hey, Joe Domino Neon Jazz. What's going on? Not a whole lot, man. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, yeah, you bet, man. I love these triumphant stories of music revival it's very necessary i mean you know you talk to any musician and the backbone of any kind of career has always been at the club level so this probably is honestly at the top of the jazz food chain well i i am certainly feeling very thankful that it it appears that we've uh we've managed to get through this first part of this craziness and hopefully you know we're in austin we're back in stage five which is not not very encouraging. <laughs> However, I, I feel I feel pretty confident that we're going to get through this mess. Nothing else crazy happens, but uh, I'm also, I guess, old enough to realize that something crazy can always happen. So I'm just thankful for every day that we're able to open and and have live musicians on the stage and have live audience members in the club. Yeah, it's just a wonderful thing. So certainly is. So let's start with the inverted pyramid at the top and kind of work our way down. Talk, tell me a little bit about your role with the Parker Jazz Club and kind of, you know, when you reopened and kind of how things are starting to unfold for you now that we've been closed for, you know, closed for almost a year and a half. Sure. Well, I am I am the owner of the club. This was my, this is literally my dream that three years ago I was able to open up. Every square inch of this club has has my blood, sweat, and tears in it, and that's not a bragging thing. That's because when you're uh, when you don't have a lot of money, you have to do things. <laughs> so a lot of a lot of uh, wiring and electrical and and plumbing, um, anything that didn't need a licensed tradesman to do, I did. It is it's my baby. I live here. I, I pretty much live here, and it's just been a, a wonderful experience for me. So then we got shut down. You know, the the night before we got shut down, I had Harry Connick's whole band on stage. They had just played a big show and. Uh, I'm friends with a couple of them. They all came over, and it was a huge jam session. It was so much fun. Then we got shut down the next day. The The 15 months that we were shut down, we still did live streams every Friday and Saturday. There were only four people in the venue. We were all socially distanced. We were all masked and gloved up. And so for 15 months, you know, we played for, played for nobody. Uh, we played for the cameras. And then as things in Austin started getting a little bit better, we, we opened back up. Uh, at very limited capacity, less than half of what we can hold in here. And we did that for about a month. And then as restrictions were, were lifted and we went from, you know, stage five to four to three to two, uh, we went ahead and opened. We're still only operating at about 75%, just because I don't want to cram people in here until I feel like we're safe. We've been open now for four months total. And, and all of that is including the limited capacity in the, in the first part. And, and now we're up to 75% capacity. Um, and people are coming out. Um, it's not my normal crowd, I will say that, but a, it's, it is a lot of new people that, uh, that are giving us a shot, and it's been a very positive thing because um, a lot of people that you know, wouldn't normally have come to Parker Jazz Club because they didn't know about it are giving us a shot, and, and the good thing is they're coming back too. Um, it was difficult having to restaff because we had to let the entire staff go when all of this went down, we tried to, I tried to hold on to as many as I could, but you know, none of these, none of these folks can survive with zero income for 15 months. You know, all of our, our great staff that we'd cultivated over a two year period was gone. We did have to start over. And in the last four months, that's what we've done. We've rebuilt a, I feel like a really good core staff. Um, they all work hard. They all share my vision for what this club and what the, what the experience we're trying to offer is here. And so all things were, were pointed to the sky, and then, you know, we just hit stage five again. So we haven't slowed down. We did lower our capacity by a little bit, but if folks want to come out, I want them to come out. Um, we're not requiring masks. We are very gently saying, 
look, if you're not vaccinated, just wear a mask. And if you are vaccinated, just wear a mask. Um, I'm not making it a rule or a mandate because that really tends to turn people off. All of my staff and all the musicians that, that I bring in here, they're all vaccinated. It's not a, it's not a hard and fast rule because I, I'm in Texas, and if I made it a rule, I would have my governor and my attorney general all over me. They'd be suing me for something. That being said, I have personal relationships with my staff and with the musicians, and I'm like, look, I, I love you. If you want to come play the club, get vaccinated. This is not a political thing. This is my kid is seven years old. The club is named for my son, Parker, and he can't get vaccinated. So I don't want one of you idiots who decides for whatever reason not to get vaccinated to get my kid sick. It's an unwritten rule, and it's really a request. But I can assure you that all of our staff and the, um, the musicians that play here regularly, they're all vaccinated. And I'm glad that you're doing that. I mean, you're writing the paychecks, and I think we're at a point right now where there's so many multiple levels of reality that almost feels like we're living in a matrix. I just can't believe that there's anything that's irrefutable with this science that did plunge numbers down low when vaccinations started. I'm just in a level of disbelief. I mean, I, I, I just think that, you know, we've gotten to a point where we've yearned and yearned for this antidote and we have it and we have to grab onto it. My, my question to you is, I guess, with all of this COVID and all of the disarray that it's caused, there's been silver linings. Do you see one of the silver linings that people that typically wouldn't go to a jazz club are clientele now? You know, I do see silver linings, and to some degree, yes. I, I think that a lot of the people that are, that are coming in were, would definitely have gone out to see live music, maybe not necessarily a jazz club, um, but because so few venues are, again, open and operating, I do think that one of the silver linings is that folks are like, well, yeah, let's give this jazz thing a shot. I think that's a, a small percentage of the people that are coming in. Uh, in. In short, I do think that that has been one silver lining thing. I don't think it's been the biggest. I think the biggest silver lining in this whole thing is that people who love music, period, have been cooped up for 15 or 16 months. And in that time, I think a lot of these folks have had the, the opportunity to go, wait a minute. We really do appreciate live music. We didn't realize it until it wasn't available to us. So I think that not only new folks that m maybe didn't, you know, weren't huge fans of jazz before, that's one part. But the other thing is even folks that love jazz are now coming out in droves because they're like, you know what, we really miss this. We need this. So that's absolutely yeah. been a silver lining. What's your background? You're obviously somebody that is dedicated, uh, you know, your entire existence as you said, blood, sweat, and tears to not only running a business, but keeping that history and tradition of jazz alive. You are in a music town. I mean, Austin is a bona fide music capital of the world. I mean, at this point, I would see it as a cradle right up there with New Orleans and Kansas City and New York and other places. So my question is, how did the bug of jazz get into you and how did this kind of filtrate into where you're at right now? The simplest way to put that was, in high school, I, I joined the jazz band, fell in love with music in high school, uh, went on to college and studied uh, at the University of North Texas. And I went to North Texas because I knew that's where Harry Connick was picking out all his musicians. And I was like, well, you know, in my 17-year-old <laughs> naivete, I was like, yeah, I'm going to go there and he's going to find me. I'm going to get discovered and I'm going to get to go play with Harry because he was my hero. And I uh, went to North Texas and transferred down to Texas State University. I love this music. Uh, I've been... Before I opened the club for a little over 20 years, it was my sole source of income. I've, I've been a, you know, I've run, you know, my, my jazz quartet for, you know, over 20 years, and I made a good living um, just playing this music. I, I love this music, um, not just because I play it, but because I study it. I like to read all the books. I love to watch all the movies. <laughs> um, I, I love this music. And in a very short time, you know, the three years that we've been, that we've been open, uh, I've I've just been so blessed. A bunch of my heroes have come and played at my club, which is just unbelievable to me. I had the Count Basie Orchestra come and play at the club. And I'm not saying that's a name drop. I'm saying these guys were my heroes when I was coming up, you know, in, in high school and college. And they came and played my club. I mean, Wynton Marsalis came and played with my band on the stage. So I love this music. And whether I'm doing it outside of the club or, or in my club, I'm, I'm always going to do this. I don't have a choice. I love this music. And it's just, I, my favorite thing about having the club is, one of the things I joked about was, I love New York City. I love New Orleans. Um, I love Kansas City. My wife's got family in Kansas City. So every time we go, I'm hanging out at 18th and Vine. I mean, I love, I, I, I love this music. And 
I, I feel like Austin didn't really have, you know, that place. Because most of the, the big jazz musicians, they pass by Austin. They'll, they'll go to Houston. They'll go to Dallas. You know, there's a, there's a bigger jazz audience in the bigger cities. Uh, and I wanted to create a place. It, it, it's, you know, if, if you can't bring the mountain to Muhammad, bring Muhammad to the mountain. I, I'm saying it the, the opposite direction. But since I can't be in New York and I can't get these huge name musicians, I, I figured, well, I'm going to build a place that maybe they'll want to come to. And in the three short years that we've been open, um, that's kind of exactly what's happened. So I'm thrilled that, that I have, it's basically like my living room. It's my dream that I can afford a space for these heroes of mine to come and, and stop into Austin and see what a great town it is that otherwise they might not because we didn't really have a world-class venue here um, where they could come and perform and, and really feel like they were in New York City. You know, I guess that's the one thing that I always find endearing and wonderful about talking to musicians and anybody that's wrapped up in this world of music, business owners, is that there's always that principle, and I'm sure it happens at Cross Pollinates and other arts, that there is that dream realized. And, and, and it almost seems like a romantic notion that you were so inspired by Harry Connick, he was the, uh, probably officially or unofficially the last show in that old world that was a part of your storytelling. Oh, absolutely. And, and I, I, I assure you, my, my adoration and love for Harry Connick has no bounds. He is my absolute hero in every sense of the word, not just as a, as a performer and a musician, but as a writer, a composer. I, I have no aspirations of acting, but I'm pretty impressed with his damn acting, too. I'll go off on a little bit of a tangent here. Um, my wife and I also love Harry Connick, and Harry's drummer uh, I went to school with. And, and it's funny, because I'm sitting here outside my club, and I'm looking at the venue across the street from me that where Harry Connick discovered Arthur Latin um, playing in Austin when he was here filming Hope Floats. This was back, would have been 96 or 97. Uh, and Arthur's been with him the whole time. And Arthur actually, with Harry Connick, made my proposal to my wife uh, a dream come true. I actually got to propose to my wife as a surprise in the middle of a Harry Connick Jr. concert. Harry hooked me up. Um, and I won't tell you the whole story because it'll take too long. I don't want to take too much of your time. But basically, my wife at the time was living in Philadelphia. I was down here playing weddings and restaurants, doing what I do. Nothing glamorous, but making money. And um, I, I told her, hey, a buddy of mine is going to be in Atlantic City. He got tickets to the Harry Connick show. Do you want to go? And, of course, she does because we love Harry. So her and my, my buddy went to go see the concert. About halfway through the concert, Harry stops the concert and says, hey, I want to bring out my good friend, um, great musician Chris Kimura, and that's when I did it. She had no idea. It was all a big secret. And I said, as, as she's walking up to the stage, we did it at the Borgata in Atlantic City. I said, Jennifer, you know I love you. You know you're my best friend. What you don't know is I've already asked your dad's permission. He's right there. I flew up her mom and dad. They were in the front row. Yeah, so, so since that time, Harry is now more than, more than just a, a hero of mine. He's someone that made my life amazing because I was able to propose to my wife at one of his concerts and then we all got to hang out with him and, and you know her folks got to meet him and um, don't get me wrong my wife would leave me in a second for Harry Connick if he were available um, uh, but, <laughs> but but I, I adore Harry uh, and that's why I thought that when this pandemic hit and I got shut down I, I had I'd resigned myself to well if this is it I did realize my dream I had a bunch of my heroes come to play, and, and Harry wasn't there that night because he had to be in L.A. the next morning, but the rest of his band was there. Uh, and I figured, well, if I'm going to go out, this is a great way to go out. And, and you know, you, you mentioned the romantic aspect. This is absolutely, I'm living the dream. I absolutely am. And I, and I don't question that for one second, how fortunate and lucky and, and I will be, I, I, I just am forever grateful for the ability, you know, the, the chance that I had to open up this club and just what's happened so far. Now, that being said, since we're reopened, I'm looking forward to all the crazy things that are going to happen now um, because I do believe that if, if nothing else, COVID has made people realize, wait a minute, the arts are important and not just jazz music, but, but music period and art period. Um, and I do think that we're going to have, and, and maybe again, I'm just living in my own, you know, rose-colored glasses, romantic um, viewpoint of the world. I truly think that there's going to be a renaissance of the arts. And I think that anyone who has a venue that, that provides, you know, an experience where people can ex truly experience this art in a good um, and positive way, we're, we're going to succeed. We're, we're going we're gonna to do wonderful things. And that's, that's why I'm optimistic right now. 
Man, you just answered so many questions that I had. Chris, thank you for opening up about your club. Thank you for putting the music out there. And hopefully everything keeps roaring forward, as I like to call the revival. And uh, I appreciate it. I do appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and club owners in Austin, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Chris for his time, energy, and cool. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.